Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you in this new academic year and at the first of the seminars of the Department of Epidemiology, the Wednesday seminars. For those of you who are in epidemiology, I hope you're not much concerned about my title. Why are epidemiologists so bad at epidemics? I could also have titled this talk, The Uses of Epidemiology, because I would like to speak about why we do epidemiology and why sometimes we have a challenge, and that is what the title, the first title refers to. The Uses of Epidemiology uh, is also the title of a book by Jerry Morris, 1957, and in that book, uh, Morris describes epidemiology as a bridge between clinical medicine and preventive medicine. He followed, in some senses, earlier, here is his book, The Uses of Epidemiology, he followed Dr. Francis Cruikshank in 1920, who talked about Hippocratic uh, epidemiology. And uh, he did so following uh, Hippocrates, of course. This is uh, a bust of the 3rd century CE, and given that Hippocrates lived in the 4th century BCE. I'm not sure it's accurate after 700 years, but Hippocrates, uh, as we all, I think, recognize, um, had the first f four major questions for medicine. In his, the corpus, he described, or his colleagues described, diagnosis, etiology, prognosis, and treatment as the main eternal medical questions. And I, I, I rephrase them into um, the uses of Hippocratic epidemiology in our field, diagnosis as assessing the big picture, etiology as studying causes, prognosis as evidence for and study of prediction, and treatment I refer to as action. And I will discuss these four Hippocratic uh, uses um, with you in, um, in this uh, seminar. So I start with the big picture. And the big picture, of course, starts for us generally with data. And this, these are the first data, uh, second half of the century, 17th century. Uh, Alfredo Morabia says that here epidemiology starts with Jim Grant, bills of mortality. Remember here in this one, uh, it says... Memento mori, and uh, this, this is the type of data that starts and gives us um, these favorite, two favorite slides of two demographers, uh, Jim Open and Jim Vaupel, working in Germany, but Jim Vaupel, American uh, of origin. Um, and in now 20, more than 20 years ago in science, they published this paper, record life expectancies uh, in various countries starting when they uh, got the data from France and then England and Wales. And you see here that life expectancy at birth in, at that time is around 35 years of age. And then around 1800, it starts to rise. Life expectancy at birth in record countries goes from about 35 to a bit off further than this slide, in 2021, the data we have from Japan, 90 years of age, 35 to 90 in a bit, a bit more than, uh, than two centuries. Uh, quite remarkable. The slope of this line is 0.25, suggesting that for every four years, uh, there is one year increase in life expectancy. I summarize this always for myself. You, you, you live a week and you effectively gain a weekend. Very, very remarkable. I think one of the most, if not the most, remarkable things in the, in the history of our species, the Homo sapiens sapiens. I, I give you the second slide. Here is a bit more detail. And uh, red is women, blue is, is men. And you see those increase, slope about 0.25 both. But there are two, or perhaps three, important elements here. First of all, there is a moment of exception. 
um, around 1918, 1920, 1919, 1920, this is, uh, as you realize, the Spanish flu, the influenza, H1N1 influenza pandemic of about a century ago. And then, so there was a decline in life expectancy. And then uh, in the 60s of the last century or a bit before that, there is a decline in life expectancy, particularly in men in record countries. And this has to do with the epidemic of heart attacks, middle-aged men, particularly heart attacks, acute coronary syndrome, as we would say now, uh, mortality high, but also there, it was on track again. Uh, there's a third observation that can be made here, and namely that if you look at, when you see the data from 1840 to 18, uh, 18 to 1900 or so, there is not much difference of life expectancy in record countries between men and women. That appears to come a bit later, and it's now, of course, we see it in all, all countries. All right, now, these data provide a big picture, and uh, this is another one that gives you a big picture. This is on uh, the prevalence of dementia. It's taken from a study that's not necessarily a study. And you see here that in this descriptive type of epidemiology, when you look at those from age 60 to 95, there's an increase, a strong increase of the, the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease up till about, what is it, nearly one in two, uh, you make it to 95. Now, when you have um, an observation, it very naturally, of course, leads to the question with age. In the category of causes. Um, points on that. One, on, on, on the methods that we have addressed in studying cause, and also, secondly, on what we have observed in a general sense. In methods, uh, I think it's fair to say that we went uh, in the past 30, 40, 50 years from descriptive epidemiology to analytic epidemiology, and we have focused in particular on causal inference. You see here three main um, events, if I may you call it that, uh, in the past uh, 75 years. First, 75 years ago, exactly now, we should celebrate this, Austin Bradford Hill, first randomized controlled trial, British Medical in 1973, causal thinking in the health science, book on causal inference, 1976 and also in 1985, theoretical epidemiology of, of Vietnam, here in this building, actually on the eighth floor of Kresge, this is Oli Mietnan, he worked then here, and uh, as many of you know, he died in late 2021. This is his very, very influential book, Theoretical Epidemiology, Principles of Occurrence Research in Medicine, very reading quite a few years later. Foresighted. It is it is a, a very remarkable book. It's not it's not easy to read. You need quite a few weeks on the beach to get contribution. This was after, this book was published in nineteen um, uh, eighty five after his most important contribution, namely in my view at least, estimability and estimation. Now, then, 1986, a very important contribution, breakthrough in, in many senses on factual prediction. And to the day that has influenced much of our work in epidemiology more recently, uh, Anan and, and his colleagues on the target trial, emulation of um, the randomized trial using observational data. And then, Mendelian randomization and the use of instrumental variables, George Davy Smith's contributions in terms of methods of causal inference, studying causes from the, from the method side, and that brings us, of course, to 
causes, and I, I focus for a moment on genes. Uh, that's something of the last, what is it, particularly for our field, epidemiology and genome-wide association studies of the last 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, you may ask why we started to think of that from the point of view of, of, of public health. And in fact, there were reservations on, on this uh, for many people. Not, no, don't focus on genes. And I never was very convinced by that. And I would like you to, for a moment, then remember what happened to Robert Koch and Max von Pettenkofer. This is my first intermezzo, Koch von Pettenkofer. Here is Robert Koch, Berlin. This is uh, second half of the 19th century, trying to find causes of many, uh, infectious diseases and particularly focusing on cholera, finding that. And this is, you can say, his uh, opponent, scientific opponent, Max von Pettenkoff in, in Munich, the leading epidemiologist, called hygienist of the, of the time, very, very influential. In fact, his institute in, in Munich is the model for one of the important uh, schools of public health of the day in, at, uh, in Baltimore, Hopkins, after his institute of this institution, well, a bit after it started here, although there is a bit debate about that. Um, Max von Pettenkofer did not believe so much in the uh, importance of the Vibrio Coma that had been discovered by Robert Koch, and he quite strongly opposed it, and in fact, even in his Selbstversuch, took uh, cholera, bacillus, and he got a bit ill, and this is most likely because the people who sent it from Berlin thought, oh, my goodness, he is our enemy, but still, let's send, send him a little bit, <laughs> a strain that's not, that's how they had, had, had put it a bit down. And so, and yeah, so. In any case, he, he and all uh, our, our senses, overall, we have to say, he is he's wrong. And so, in a moment, I will tell you then why this, uh, this, he is still so important that he is on, rather than Robert Koch, on the frontier piece of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Pettenkofer is there, Koch not. Now, in genes, what did we do? In, in typically in epidemiology, in this case in Alzheimer's disease, you study family histories, then you have a specific epidemiologic observation in this case, very often in diseases. In, the, in Down syndrome, trisomy 21, where you have the changes in plaques and tangles that you see much more in Down children than in people than in uh, in others, we have molecular epidemiology studies, and then 30 years ago, this is the first gene. John Hardy, at that time working in, in Bethesda, um, the amyloid precursor protein gene. And around the time, this is a few years later, we had then three major genes, and then it stopped. Couldn't find any more. Until we had genome-wide association study. Major contribution, I think, of epidemiology, you, well, we call it association studies, always wonderful because it's straight case control studies, but genome-wide association studies led to, for example, this now over the past 20 years, started in early in, in, in this century, um, now we have 45, 48 implicated in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Major, major we can, you know, use to see why is it, how is it that Alzheimer's disease uh, comes about. Very important contribution. Interaction. Interaction. Very important of our topics. Also in the case of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease, but of course as an agenda for us very much, gene-gene and gene-environment interaction. And I would like to... This is the person that first, as far as I know, first more or less robust conceptually described this idea of interaction. Anybody who this is? The young Max von Pettenkofer. In his <laughs> previous slide, he was, what is it, 84, just a year before his death here. He's a young professor in Germany. He described Boden und Grundwasser in the Beziehung zu Cholera, so the, the soil and the water 
in connection to cholera, 1869. It, it was more than a century until in this institution major contributions were there from Yetnin and Rothman in the American Journal of Epidemiology. And I think the most important overall contribution has been, the title is there, Explanation and Causal Inference 2015. So that took a long time after Max von Pettenkofer, but now we are there where we want to be, and perhaps even there will be major development. Interaction. That brings us to prediction. Causes on the method side from you know, description to analysis, on the, on the substantive side, very, very many contributions in terms of uh, risk factors, causes, environmental factors, celebrated case, of course, smoking and lung cancer, but also in genes, very, very much in the past 20 years. Prediction. Prediction. I'm not going to discuss that in, 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 in at all, actually, but I would like to make a few comments about cohorts, not so much about big data or AI, as to wait for another time. Cohorts. When is the first population-based cohort? Clinical cohorts were old. That's but the first population-based cohort, as I know it, is not so old. It's actually this. Weinberg. In 1913, children of uh, people with tuberculosis, who have more tuberculosis themselves and have a higher mortality, first, first cohort study, population-based cohort study. Weinberg, many of you may know him because of the Hardy Weinberg, Hardy Weinberg, uh, uh, genetic equilibrium, uh, population genetics uses this all the time. And it's very interesting. I find it always, you know, I'm optimistic about this. Hardy, one of the most celebrated uh, statisticians at Cambridge. And Weinberg, simple may I use the term, internist in Germany, came independent of each other to the same type of uh, proposition here. And that's why it's called the Hardy Weinberg. That's equilibrium. This was the first cohort study, as far as I know, at least, in, in the population. But, of course, there were many other. The archetypes are, just to have one from this continent and another from, from Europe, the Framingham Heart Study, 1948, 5,000. British Doctor Study, Dolan Hill, uh, 40,000 in 1950, around the same time. Um, and that worked in cohort studies, small with extensive data, typically here, Framingham and, and some other studies. And the large ones, amongst other, the Nurses Health Study here, uh, UK Biobank, many of you know this. Uh, and I would particularly plug for a moment the German National Cohort, not so well known yet, but it will be big, 200,000. But it is a kind of combination. It's a hybrid. It's a combination between that is large data and extensive data. It's a combination of the two important cohort studies. Of course, not only for prediction, also for analytic, for causal studies. But the first prediction uh, models have been based on Framingham Heart Study. Jerome Cornfield, in particular, has worked on that with Framingham data. Richard Dawes, a few years before he died, uh, summarized this as, as follows. Cohort studies, in the modern sense, have established themselves as essential tools for epidemiological research and cohort studies have, I suspect, an in two views in this. I would like to express this for a moment. First, I... I uh, I bring Peter Schrabanek. Peter Schrabanek wrote in The Lancet, 1986, many years ago already. He was a refugee from communist, and let me think now, at that time, Czechoslovakia. He worked at that time in Ireland and Dublin. It is not the business of medicine, he said in his one of his boutades in The Lancet. It's not the business of medicine to make people virtuous, but to save them from the consequences of their vices. Okay. Then... My academic hero, one, but it's number one actually, is Jeffrey Rose. 
and he wrote, as you, I think, I hope all know, The Strategy of Preventive Medicine, Oxford University Press, listed by Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, as one of the 25 most important books of medicine of all times, and rightly so, I think, 1992. And his uh, motto, his mantra was, we are responsible for all. And he took this, of course, from, of, of course, from Fyodor Dostoevsky, in which the great inquisitor asked the, one of the brothers, Karamazov, are we not all responsible for all? You, did you know, do you know what, what the brothers said? They had, different, they had different answers. We are all responsible. I oscillate between those two things in whether we should have major action in, in, in medicine or public health behavioral action in particular. But I also follow very much the idea of, of Jerry Morris, 1957, as I said, epidemiology as the bridge between clinical medicine and, and, and preventive medicine. I leave it here on, on, uh, on action. There's a lot more to be said about it. But I go now to, again, as I had promised, to the big picture. I gave you data. I said we have this, you know, descriptive studies like, like uh, on Alzheimer's disease. Here is one. And I said there, this, uh, there were two exceptions to this beautiful increase, this, this triumph of the homo sapiens from a societal side and also from a public health and medical side, I would think, triumph this increase. There were two exceptions, but that's not true anymore, at least for this country. Here is the third exception to this. This is taken from a piece of Ann Carson and e, uh, D, uh, Angus Deaton. In, uh, this is presented to the U.S. Senate in 2015, and later on published in books and in articles. And, uh, but this is the first, I think, time there was a very systematic review of mortality among various countries, you see here France, whatever, Germany, UK, all happily mortality going down. And here, at that time, for white non-Hispanic males, aged 45 to 54, young, huh? 45 to 54, there was not a decline in mortality. In fact, there was an increase in mortality that later on was also in other cities. This started some started before Purdue, you have to say, before oxycodone. And, so. and then they published this, presented this in around 20 years later, in 2015, economists, not epidemiologists. I don't think even before that there is some, there is some you know, evidence that before 2015 there were m small papers from the Center for Disease Control and the health statistics here in this country, but not really. No role, no play of epidemiology in this. This is a, taken from the New York Times about a, a year, a bit more than a year later, 2017, the first time this got majorly exposed, not majorly by epidemiologists, but by great journalists, I may say, you see here, and you see here what the various causes are. Uh, fentanyl, as you see here huh, on top, but the, also the uh, opioids, regular opioids. And that led to 2019, so this is a bit later actually, and there's 70,000 deaths. We knew it then for four years. 94,000 deaths in 2020. Generally young people, huh? 2021, 20, 108,000 deaths, and 2022, 120,000 deaths. I saw this around, start to think about it, 2017, 18, and wrote a paper, and then wanted to submit it. The, paper, the title of the paper was, Why are epidemiologists so bad at epidemics? Wanted to submit it and then the pandemic started. And I remember I talked with Mark and I said, what should I do? I said, well, probably not publish it because <laughs> you, 
don't make it more difficult for us than it already is. Okay, so I, I didn't forget that this is, I think, a major failure of, may I say this, epidemiology. All the failures to be discussed, actually. But I think lung cancer started in the end of the 19th century, went big way up. It took us half a century before we seriously started to consider that. I, I give a bit injustice to quite a number of people now, and I summarize this, but I'm not sure we did very well in lung cancer, actually, as epidemiologists. Obesity and diabetes mellitus, I studied this in more detail, clear, what, 20 years after the fact, and even then we did not predict very well what the relationship would be with, between obesity and diabetes. Now it's, of course, very much in the clear, but not at that time. Then declines, not very good at that. I, I give you heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. Here is heart disease. This is in a paper from Jerry Stamler in circulation, 1985. In which he said, yeah, we have, uh, we see a decline in heart disease. This is myocardial infarction, basically, ischemic heart disease, coronary, acute coronary syndrome, as we say now. And you saw an increase, and we knew that from, say, the, the second, the first half already, end of the first half of the 20th century. And then in around 1960, it starts to go down again. 20 years before it was first observed by great epidemiologists like Stamler and others. This has been studied in detail by David Jones, and you, it's a very good idea to read his articles about this. And next week he will speak in this seminar. He is the next speaker. Okay. This is, uh, bring this back to you, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. We thought let's put a group of people together to study the trends in the incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease as, as a major pandemic. We had nine population-based cohorts, unfortunately only in, in North America and in Europe, and we saw a decline over the past three decades of about perhaps 15, 10, 15 percent, perhaps a bit more, depending a bit on how you look at the data, uh, for each decade. And this decline had been going on already since at least the 1990s, if not earlier. Reasons why? Well, can debate about it. My personal idea is that it has to do with the fact that we started to treat risk for heart disease and risk factors for heart disease. Cardiovascular disease are also risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So if you go on and push that as it was done in North America and it was done in in Europe, in Western Europe in particular, it's likely that then you have a decline, so that's the most likely candidate. But there are other ideas about this as well. But in any case, it was certainly, we were not early. It, this was 20, when the Rotterdam study published this 2015, framing them two years later or a bit uh, 2017, and then in this overall analysis is published in neurology in 2020. So it's not that we were very early. Again, perhaps what kind of sense of failure of getting the big picture uh, in epidemiology. COVID-19 pandemic, Mark, I am not so sure about this. I think the jury is still out there. It's, I think the major contributions have been had in predicting the frequency, in modeling. This is not my field, so I will ask Mark later to comment on it. I think in terms of modeling, particularly in this institution, quite well. The frequency, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we had in place sufficient, insufficient, and in important countries in this sense, surveillance to the extent that it was easy or possible to predict the frequency at the right time. And it's good then that the CDC has now started with a forecasting center to further develop that. Of course, there were other contributions from epidemiologists also in this on uh, major you know, treatment. Dexamethasone eff effectively is a, was an epidemiologic observation, I think, and also the contributions to the development of vaccines and studying the efficacy, and particularly also the safety of it, very important contributions. But overall, I think the jury is still out. I don't think we can immediately say that this is a, was, a, was a failure. I, I, I doubt that, actually. But 
would be good actually to, to discuss this. Now, that brings us to John Gordon. John Gordon was the first chair of epidemiology um, after the break up of the Department of Epidemiology, which is the oldest department here, into the Department of Social Medicine, which went to the medical school, and the Department of Epidemiology, which stayed in the School of Public Health, or was in the School of Public Health when it was established. In 1942, in a beautiful, you can find it in the country, in a beautiful course text, it's not in a book, but in a course text, he talked about epidemiology is the diagnostic discipline of mass disease, 1942, John Gordon. He was succeeded by, that's interesting, huh? He was not succeeded by Jerry Morris, because Jerry Morris at the same time, 1957, brought this idea very much to the forefront as a summary of what was called new epidemiology after the Second World War, new epidemiology, very strong focus on diagnosis, individual diagnosis, population diagnosis. It was also taken up by the successor of Gordon, Professor Brian McMahon, who was started in 19... 58 and was for 28 years the chair of the Department of Epidemiology. I, as, as a chair now, I am, whew, how do we manage that? 28 years and really build up this department and particularly the methods uh, development in, in the department. But in the book, the first book that he wrote together with uh, Pew and Ibsen, um, 1960, there is not so much emphasis on that. There's very much more emphasis on Diagnosis on starts off with the classic, you know, person, place, time. Very much that. It is only in ten years later. This is dedicated to John Gordon, so they were very much involved. Um, second edition of this book, the second form, because it's another book, also another title, Epidemiology Principles and Methods, had a quite a different orientation, very much more related to focusing on analysis. I'm sure influenced by many people in the department later on, amongst others, particularly by, I think, by, by Mietnen, you know, a bit contre coeur, but by Mietnen. And then this, what is referred to as the second edition of this book by Brian McMahon and by his successor, Dimitrios Trikopoulos, has really less emphasis even there on descriptive epidemiology and on various you know, say sampling methods or surveillance type of studies. So, epidemiology and epidemics. What do we see? I think from um, the 70s onward, from the new epidemiology to modern epidemiology, and modern epidemiology starts, according to Alfredo Arabia, uh, Morabia, uh, in 1976, by Oli Mietnin's paper, 1976, Estimability and Estimation. It went from description to analysis. I, I remember having, being in a course of Mietnin, many of you, no, not many of you, given your, some of you may have heard that as well, that Mietnin said, well, description, no, no, no. It's just that that's, that's a prerequisite for analysis. It is part of analysis. Analysis, description, no, no. So we went from description to analysis. And, by the way, that's very successfully. There is it's really a, has, has been a major contribution in terms of methods and in terms of observations, in terms of the combination of epidemiologic work as a science and a discipline in analysis. But we changed a bit the orientation. There is no focus after you know, the 80s, 90s, on the diagnosis of mass disease. Even when HIV AIDS started in the early 80s, it was really not really. There was, a, there was, of course, a resurgence of infectious disease epidemiology, but not of the sense among our field. We really have to look at how we, you know, diagnose mass disease or in other, or in chronic diseases. There has not been a focus on that, in, at least in my reading of what happened.
the focus is in in uh, when description to analysis on in the type of knowledge it's on abstract knowledge rather than on particularistic knowledge is on abstract knowledge independent of time and place smoking causes lung cancer rather than you know, knowledge that is dependent on time and place particularistic knowledge namely what do we need in terms of you know institutions mental health say institutions in this particular community in order to serve our, our population, our people. That's particularistic knowledge. Our focus in epidemiology, I think, has shifted very much from this particularistic into the abstract knowledge. What did not help, particularly not in the US, but there, there's quite a strong separation between clinical and community medicine, and quite a strong separation between medical schools and schools of public health. This is not in all countries the case. And I'm not sure these other countries are doing much better, so this is only part of the overall diagnosis, I think. But that did not help. And particularly in the opioid crisis, I talked with our clinical colleagues and also tried to understand how, what happened in, in, in public health. And you see our clinical colleagues say, we knew that was going on. And it was not known in, 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 in our public health community and the other way around. What happened in the, in, 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 in the, in the community was not known in clinical medicine. I think it has you know, been part of the fact that now last year 120,000 people died because of overdose. And then perhaps also to be debated is because of this separation, perhaps lack of subject matters on both sides in clinical medicine on what you do in terms of community, public specific clinical and perhaps even sometimes biologic areas. If this is right, then I may ask you a question, namely, is it perhaps time to renew a focus on descriptive epidemiology? Do we need a renewed emphasis in our education? We have a few things related to particularly infectious diseases, thank God, uh, in, in our educational programs, but do we need more emphasis on that? Do we also need a renewed emphasis on descriptive epidemiology? You know, research programs, perhaps. With that, given that we have still a few minutes, because there's a class afterwards, I don't think there's any, any room that is used so, so well in this uh, here than this room. Hour after hour after hour. I bring you my summary. We had great successes in epidemiology and in analytic epidemiology. I, there's no, nobody can convince me though we have sometimes debates, and that's to be expected, that we did not, in many senses, great in terms of finding causes of disease and in also f making further com you know, contributions to how to deal with that. We had less so the success in descriptive epidemiology, I think. And my question to you, and that's a good start, I think, of the Q&A, which we have a few minutes for, is, is there a need for remedy? It was my great pleasure to tell you all this, and I thank you very much, also on behalf of the Department of Epidemiology. Thank you.